are we able to figure out how our system works? Well, we know if we have a given tightness, we know, if I take a given tightness theta, I know how many uh, firms I employ. We know that firms are going to employ LD of theta. I know how many workers find jobs. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of all set. The problem is that I don't know what is theta. So um, that's the last thing that we have to figure out. So um, this is reminiscent of what happens in a neoclassical uh, labor market. And so let's pause for a second and uh, try to uh, remind ourselves of a neoclassical labor market. Um, so what do we have on a neo neoclassical labor market? So we know that for a given wage, I know that um, firms, they want to employ LDW workers. We know that uh, LSW workers uh, want a job. So LD being the neoclassical labor demand, LS the neoclassical labor supply. Uh, so, you know, you have everything you want, but you also face that question. Um, but um, what is W on the wage? Um, so how do you solve that, uh, that question in the um, neoclassical labor market? Um, so often, you know, people are going to say, oh, well, we know what W is. Uh, People are going to say that W is such that we say the labor uh, market clears. Okay, that's the expression that you hear uh, very often. Um, you know, W is such that supply is equal to demand. Okay? Um, but the question is, you know, why should that be? Well, why is there any reason to expect that uh, the wage is such that supply equal demand or uh, you know the labor market? So why why would we expect a labor market clearing? Or supply is equal to demand. Um, so there are several stories that you probably heard in a micro uh, in microeconomics earlier in your curriculum. Um, so one thing that um, you often hear about is that you have an auctioneer um, who is in the background and makes sure that the wage is such that supply is equal to demand. Um, you know, what people sometimes refer to as the invisible hand after uh, Adam Smith's expression, the invisible hand of the market. Um, but you know, there are a few markets that indeed have auctioneers. I mean, you know, uh, of course, art auctions. Um, you also have auctions for agricultural goods. Um, you have, you know, of course, auctioneers on the stock market. But there are very few markets that have auctioneers. So, and especially the labor market doesn't have an auctioneer. Um, so that doesn't seem like a very good justification uh, for why we would expect to have um, supply is equal to demand or labor market. Another story that you hear sometimes is that, um, and which is best uh, illustrated by a diagram, is that if supply was unequal to demand um, at 
the wage that um, firms and workers take as given. Some firms of, of some workers would offer a different wage. Um, and because we're in a competitive um, market where everybody observes everything, you know, if a worker suddenly offers a lower wage, all the firms would hire that worker and the market, you know, would uh, unravel that all the wages uh, all the wages would have to be lowered. Or if a firm offered a higher wage, all the workers would flock to that firm and the other firms you know, would have to um, increase their wage to be able to compete. And again, the, the wage uh, would increase. So it's something that looks like this if you um, draw a little diagram of the neoclassical uh, market. So I put my wage I put employment, I put a labor demand here, I put a labor supply here. And so the idea is, for instance, if the wage that firms and workers take as given is here, so what happens here? Um, so if you're in a situation like this, as you can see, the number of workers who want to work at that high wage is much larger than the number of workers that firms want to hire. So the idea is that, and if we were at a point like this, you know, firms were, you know, expect a high wage, they know how many workers they want to hire. Workers expect a high wage, we also know how many workers want to work, and then it turns out that, in fact, many, many more workers want to work than firms are, are ready to hire. And so, you know, here you would have a problem because you have all these guys who want to work, but they're just not enough jobs. And here the story is that workers would start offering lower wages, you know, maybe something like this, and uh, so that firms would flock to them. And as long as there is a gap, so that you have workers who don't have jobs but are willing to work at that wage, they would keep on offering a lower wage, offering a lower wage until you would get to that point like this. And at that stage, the number of people who want to work is exactly equal to the number of um, workers that firms are willing to hire. And so, you know, everybody is happy. The workers who want to work, they work at a given wage. The firms employ exactly the right number of workers. You know, there is no, nobody is going to offer any wage that's any different. Same thing if you were below that. Um, if you had started, if firms and workers had taken as given a wage that was too low, Maybe something like this. Here, the number of uh, workers that firms want to hire would be much bigger than the number of workers who are willing to work. So you have a bunch of firms who had planned to hire many workers who are left without workers. And so these firms that would start offering higher wages to attract workers. And uh, so, you know, maybe you have a slightly higher wage and you get there, but here you still have firms who are willing to hire workers, don't have them, they offer higher wages. And so then, you know, all the wage have to go up in the market, otherwise firms would move from the low wage firm to the higher wage firm, and so on, and at the end, you convert again to your equilibrium. So the only point where nobody would make different offers is that point where supply is equal to demand here. So this would be the market wage W star, L star, and this would be uh, you know, an equilibrium here. So according to this story, the only um, position on the market where the market is stable, if you want, where nobody makes uh, alternative wage offer is where supply is equal to demand. Okay, and so then people using that story, they say, well, has to be that supply is equal to demand. Now, the problem with that story is that the model doesn't formalize at all how these offers are made, how people compete on the market. Uh, so it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a parable, but it's not very satisfying because the model doesn't explain how this adjustment uh, occurs. And in fact, um, people have worked to try to formalize that adjustment process where you start from some wage there's some demand on supply, and if the demand and supply are not the same, you know, uh, either some side of the market are rationed, so people are not able to find the, the wage they want, some firms are not able to find the workers they want, people are able to make counter-offers, and so on and so forth. Um, but this is really not part of the, of the basic model. 
So that justification of offers is not very satisfying. Um, to me, the most satisfying justification for why supply has to be equal to demand on a neoclassical market is again uh, you know, due, to, uh, due to Thomas Kuhn. Um, so Kuhn, we talked about him earlier, we said that he, he highlighted what were important properties of Mona Lisa and we know that model had to be descriptive, that to describe reality well, they had to be a help to memory. Right? They have to organize a great number of facts in a very simple fashion so that you can keep the model in your head and use it um, to look at the world around you. And they have to be a guide to the unknown. You have to be able to use your model to make predictions about things you haven't seen and help you know, the empirical, uh, empirical analysis of the world. Uh, the, it helps measure new things in the world. Something else that uh, Kuhn talked about is that what was critical is that your model has to be uh, internally consistent. And that, if you want, is just a basic requirement of the model. Even before you have a model that's descriptive and so on and so forth, at the minimum, your model has to be internally consistent. And um, so if we think about it, the only way that the competitive model of the labor market can be internally consistent is if supply is equal to demand. Why is that? Well, it's because um, when we derive, uh, when you derive the supply, the labor supply, workers are going to assume that, so they take the wage as given, and they assume that at that wage, they are always able to find a job. And um, given that they can find a job, they are going to decide you know, how much they want to work, how much they want to consume, how much they want to save, um, and so on. On the firm side, it's exactly the same. Firms, given the market wage, they are going to assume that they are able to hire as many workers as they want. And then they are going to plan, you know, to decide how many workers they want, how much capital they want, how much they are going to sell. Okay? So when they make their decision, firms and workers assume that they can you know, sell as much labor as they want or buy as much labor as they want. Okay? And for your model to be internally consistent, it has to be that once you are in equilibrium, so once the model has uh, you know, once your model is in that internally consistent position, it has to be that indeed uh, firms are able to sell, uh, to buy whatever labor they want, and firms are able, and workers are able to sell whatever labor they want. Okay? Um, so the equilibrium condition, it's a condition for internal consistency. Okay. Um, so, so far, we've imposed that, or in the neoclassical model, we impose that workers behave rationally given market variables, firms behave rationally given market variables, but then there's always a question of how the aggregate variables, the market level variables, so here the wage are determined. And um, these variables are determined by what we always call equilibrium condition. This equilibrium condition, they really always are condition for internal consistency. And so here, the uh, equilibrium condition, the condition for uh, internal consistency, it has to be that supply is equal to demand. Because once supply is equal to demand, uh, anybody, so basically the number of workers who want to find a job is equ exactly equal to the number of workers who will be hired. Therefore, if you're a worker who wants to work, you will be able to work. If you have a job that a firm wants to fill, the firm will be able to fill it. And it's only when supply is equal to demand that this is realized. Right? Because if, if the wage is at a different level, as we've seen here, if the wage is too high, um, like say here, if um, W is too high, your model cannot be internally consistent because um, the number of workers will actually find a job is much less than the number of workers who would like to find a job. 
So actually, not everybody is able to find a job at the given wage. So the assumption that households made when they made their calculation that they could find a job if they wanted to is not satisfied. Okay. So here you are in a situation that is consistent with the assumption um, that everybody uh, can work at W. Okay? Um, and here it's the same if your wage is too low. What happens? Well, you know, firms that were planning to be able to hire as many workers as they wanted at that low wage, but it turns out that you can't force people to work and there is just not enough people who want to work at that wage. So that situation is inconsistent with um, the assumption um, that firms can hire, you know, um, anybody they want at W or anybody they need at um, W. Okay? Um, so if your market is not in equilibrium, your, your model is not going to be consistent because firms and workers are going to behave under the assumption that you know because you're you know they think that the market is competitive. Um, that the assumption under a competitive market is that you can always work at the market wage, you can always hire workers at the market wage. The only way that this is actually satisfied is if uh, your market uh, clears, if supply is equal to demand. Okay? So really, I think the easiest way to justify the market clearing assumption in the competitive market is that it's the only position at which your model is internally consistent. So you have agents who are rational and on top of it, you know, and they, take, they always take this aggregate variable as given, but that aggregate variable will be subject to the model is internally consistent. 